So we're in Luke chapter 9 this morning. Luke chapter 9. And it's a story that's familiar to many of us, I'm sure. This is the only miracle of Jesus's that's recorded in all four of the Gospels. The only one, of, well, apart from obviously uh, resurrection. Why is that? Why is it so, why is it so important? Um, as we're gonna see on our little PowerPoint thingy, um, that is a picture of, uh, that's carved into the walls of Roman catacombs where uh, I think in the second and third centuries, Christians would hide away from intense persecution and they would carve that in because it was a symbol of Jesus' provision. And I think it's gonna teach us something else as well this morning. And what I want us to learn is that our service to God and to people ought to be spiritual and practical. And that's my takeaway point. Our service to God and people ought to be spiritual and practical. And we read in the first part of Luke chapter nine that Jesus had sent out the 12 apostles and he'd sent them to teach and to heal. And then he went out through all the villages. There's a few verses in between that talks about Herod. And then in verse 10, we read this, that on their return, that is the 12, the apostles told him, Jesus, of all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. So, you wanna know where that is? Here we are, Bethsaida's, I think that's the pointer. Bethsaida's up there on the northeast of Lake Galilee. And um, he did that because he needed a rest. They'd been busy. They'd had their first preaching tour and, and healing tour, if you like. Um, and so they were tired. And Jesus, in his grace, took his servants aside to come and rest a while. And it's not wrong to rest. It's not wrong to rest. In fact, it's obedient to rest when God says so. So he does this, he t takes them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned it, they followed him. Now, just imagine the feeling. Yeah, also, Jesus had been out preaching during this time, as well as the, the, the 12. So they're tired, they're going for their sort of spiritual retreat off to, off to the, the backside of Bethsaida, up in the hills. And they're thinking, yes, finally. You know, they'll, they'll take the socks off and wiggle the toes and be like, ah, that feeling that you have when you have your first sip of a cup of tea. That's how they were feeling. And then as they turn around, they see crowds of people again. They'd spent, I don't know, however many days with all these people. This was their time. Well, here they were, crowds of people. What would you be like? What would you say? <laughs> would you run? Um, I think I probably would. Um, I'd jump in my boat and sail on somewhere else. Well, what did Jesus do? The crowds followed him and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and he cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away and the 12 came and said to him, send the crowd away and go into the surrounding villages and the countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. I want us first to think about this, attitude. Crowds of people were drawn to Jesus. They hadn't even considered food preparation. How do I know that? Because the disciples came and they said, send them away so they can go and get some food. We assume that they'd been there all day listening to Jesus. I don't know what that would have looked like, 5,000 people. Um, but all, all the time they listened to him, Jesus was healing them, and he, he drew on energy from God to, to meet the needs of this crowd. And we also get the impression that the crowds would have been willing to stay on even longer. How do we think this? Because it was the disciples who were having to encourage them to try to go away. Many people are attracted to Jesus. Many people are attracted to Jesus today, but sometimes are put off by us, his followers. What is my attitude? It's okay to say, 
Lord, I've got a bad attitude. In fact, it's better to say, Lord, I've got a bad attitude than to pretend that you've got a good attitude. Because when we're honest with God, then he gives us what we need to give to others. And we'll come on to that a little bit later. Other gospel writers, Matthew and Mark, say of Jesus that when he looked on the crowd, do you remember what it said of him? It said that he was moved with compassion because he looked on the crowds as sheep without a shepherd. Jesus' attitude was one of compassion. Now the disciples suggested sending them away, those who were initially welcomed by Jesus. And we can be like that too, can't we? It's hard. Maybe there's somebody in your life who you're really, really trying to help practically, or you're trying to bring them along in the faith, and it's just very draining, if you're honest. Um, you know, you can think of those people in your life, I can think of them in mine, and we can just feel tired. And we can be like, yeah, okay, it's, it's time to go now. There is time for a rest, but first let us acknowledge to God, Lord, this is my attitude, give me your attitude. Let us have an attitude like Christ. Second thing I want us just to shortly think about is this. The way in which Jesus met the people, the crowds who came, and also the thing that Jesus sent the apostles out to do was what? It was to preach and, and to heal. Their service to, to people and also to God, because as they serve people, that was their act of worship, was spiritual and practical. I liked it in the video, um, the lady said that God has an extra passion for the poor and needy, and it's true, it's true. I think that the, the Evangelical Church with a capital E, we sometimes, if we think about being practical in our service, um, and being, say, uh, involved in societal things, and being spiritual and preaching and these kind of things, we often fall off one side of the horse on one extreme. But the way in which Jesus sent out his disciples, and the way that the early church was, is they were intensely practical and spiritual as well. I've said that Jesus sent the twelve out to preach and to heal, and um, we saw in the start of chapter 9, Jesus gave them power and authority over all demons. And that tells us what? Tells us that Jesus has authority over all sickness and all demons, which we thank God for, and he still has that authority today. But he gave them these abilities, these miraculous abilities. Now, some people look at these and they say these sort of miraculous things were just given to authenticate a message that the disciples were bringing. And I'd say that is true. These things did authenticate the message, but they didn't only do that. That wasn't their sole purpose. You know, if, if Jesus wanted to authenticate that he really was God and that this message really was true, surely he could have given the disciples the ability to like spell things out in the clouds or to make a bird out of clay or to do anything. But the sort of um, things that he gave them the authority to do were to heal and to cast out demons. They were acts of mercy. And so we see that the way in which um, Jesus has seen, the way in which people come and think, yeah, this message has got something to it, is through mercy. You know, through acts of love and kindness, practical things. They support they go hand in hand um we can think of it in this way you know our our, our service um, two wings of an airplane if you like spiritual the preaching the prayer the the discipleship the evangelism and practical and an airplane that's only got one wing is, is, is in a bit of trouble isn't it um it might be able to take off but it's very unlikely and if it's up in the air already then it's just going to be spinning around in circles we need both In Luke chapter 9, where um, the disciples suggested sending the people away, in verse 13, Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. And we know from John's gospel that he did this in order to test them, 
to try their faith. But they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we're to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men, and that is besides women, so presumably about 5,000 women, and the children that you'd think would come as well because they wouldn't be left at home. So a lot of people, thousands of people. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so, and he had them all sit down. Jesus was going to provide for them. He had been teaching them of the kingdom of God. We read that before. And people need that. Our, our, our spirit and soul, our, that, that part of us which will, as soon as our body dies, go and be somewhere eternally. Later on, our bodies will be connected with that. But the state of our soul is of the utmost importance. If you don't know that you are right with God, that the sin that separates us naturally from him is dealt with, then we are in trouble. And Jesus is very clear about that. Jesus said, unless somebody's born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. There needs to be a change inside of us. That change comes when we acknowledge our sin, that selfishness ultimately, that idolatry, putting things ahead of God, be that even good things like family or work. That is idolatry, putting things ahead of God and breaking God's law. We need to acknowledge that as wrong before God. But welcome what Jesus did for us on the cross in that he took the punishment for our sins on himself to take that away. Our trust in him gives us that right standing with God. But Jesus taught him of the kingdom of God. But he also, he heard the cries of their hearts, but he heard the rumbling of their stomach as well, and he cared about both. Our God isn't just concerned with the spiritual. God doesn't just care about Sundays. God doesn't just care about your devotional time in the morning or when you pray at your bedside at night. He cares about your whole life. He wants to be Lord over your whole life. Time with your family, time at work, that sort of, I don't know how much of your waking time is spent at work, but a lot of it, and he cares about it all. And he wants to be king over it all, and he wants to make it all fruitful. He cares about body, spirit, and soul. And our service should be spiritual and practical. Um, I'm going to give us a couple of examples of um, people who have served God in a practical and a spiritual way. Uh, Firstly, um, it's an old painting from the Greco-Roman times, um, which is the time of Christ. And in the Greco-Roman world, infanticide and abandoning of infants was very common. Um, the lady in the cap video said this, that um, people are labeled as invalid and cast off. Well, that was children. You know, um, if, if a Roman family had a son, that was great. If they had a daughter, that really wasn't that good. If they had a second daughter, she was bound to be dispatched. And it was very common in those days. They'd be thrown into the river. You know the story of Romulus and Remus, how Rome was founded. They're two children who were thrown away into the river by parents who didn't want them. It was common. And so early Christians not only spoke out against this and proclaimed the sanctity of life, but they took the boats and they caught the children from out the river. Um, Somebody called Beninus Dijon, who lived in the second century, he was a student of Polycarp, he took in abandoned children, some of whom were deformed because of botched abortions. Um, A lady called Afra of Augsburg, who was a former prostitute to the Christian um, in the late third century, she developed a ministry to cast away children of prisoners, thieves, smugglers, and runaway slaves, and she took them in. It wasn't all words, but it was deeds. It wasn't just spiritual, but it was practical. Um, This gentleman here is called F.B. Meyer, who some of you will have heard of. He was a a pastor, a a preacher, an evangelist. And um, in the 1800s, he helped to um, rehabilitate ex-offenders and get them back in work. And so he set up a window cleaning business, of all all things, uh, to give these men jobs. Um, Modern day counterpart is walk ministries and others similar that do the same kind of thing in Stoke. Um, This man here um, in the middle is Bob Pierce. 
He was um, a touring evangelist uh, in the 1970s, and he was touring Asia when he came across some particularly poor um, places. And God moved his heart, and so he set up a charity called Samaritan's Purse, which many of us know today. He wasn't just doing the preaching, but he was going to help. He was going to be moved to act. And of course, Christians Against Poverty is another charity like that. Um, There are so many commands, particularly in the Old Testament, about justice and looking after the poor. And they're taking those as written and doing something about it. And of course, our Savior, he didn't just teach, but he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so practical acts are spiritual as they're done in worship to God. Uh, Part of my, uh, what I'd love to see um, the church move into is this, serving in practical ways. How can we help our community? We do want to see them come to Christ and be saved. That is top of the agenda. But we care about all of them because Jesus does. So, you know, maybe, maybe as we watch that cat video, God has stirred your heart as that, uh, that's something that you could be involved in. It would be great if we could run a money course from here and invite people in the area who are struggling and in debt. You know, we've got people who live in very fancy houses and drive nice cars around here, but we've probably got people who are in loads of debt because of it. Um, people who are covering up their, their despair by buying more stuff that they can't really afford. Maybe we can help them. Um... I'm all ears as to how we can do that, so please do share your thoughts. And finally, um, I want us to think about this. Um, Our attitude is important. We want the attitude of Christ, and our service should be spiritual and practical. But there's a principle here at the bottom that I want us to see from John chapter, um, Luke chapter 9. Jesus says, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And then verse 15, they did so and had them all sit down. And um, taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Now, maybe Jesus used the traditional Jewish blessing. blessing. I know Laura and some of the homeschooling families went to a synagogue not long ago. Maybe you were taught this. But um, particularly when um, you're going to have bread, uh, a Jewish father or the leader of the meal will say, Baruch atah Adonai, I'm going to have to read it. (laughs) Baruch atah Adonai Elcheinu Melech HaOlam HaAmati Lechem Nun HaAretz. Amen. (laughs) Which means, blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe who brings forth bread from the earth. Maybe Jesus said that um, as the Jewish Messiah and he distributed what he had. But he did that, um, uh, said a blessing over them, then he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. I've put Jesus to you, to me, to you. Because there's a principle in in Scripture that when we serve, we are to be co-laborers with God. And that almost sounds a little bit Blasphemous, really, because if we are co-laborers, we're on the same working level as God. But that's what the New Testament says, that we are to be co-laborers with him. He wants to work through you. When we serve, it's not like, you know, I've got to drum myself up and really, come on, Matt, you need some more compassion. Squeeze it out. But like we've looked at before, as we abide in Christ, he provides what we as the branches need, and we are co-laborers with him. Think of the ways that Jesus could have fed the 5,000. He could have just clicked his fingers and filled up their stomachs, couldn't he? He could have, like in the time of the Exodus, dropped manna and birds in the sky. But what he chose to do was to work through the disciples. Did you notice how that worked again? He blessed it, he broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And perhaps this miracle was as much for the disciples as the crowd. The miracle itself happened in the hands of Jesus. 
But as he gave to them, they could give to others. You don't have it in you to help to any eternal, lasting consequence. Um, You've probably been there where you've tried to help, but you've actually caused more harm than good, or you've put your foot in your mouth. Well, yeah, that happens. But Jesus wants to do the miracle himself and work through you to reach others. Jesus has committed the gospel to us. He could have written it in the sky, but he's put it in our mouths to bring to others. Jesus could click his fingers and solve world hunger, but he's given the resources to us to then distribute. You may think that you've got little to give to others. And uh, what was actually given uh, was a boy's lunch, as you probably know the story in the other gospel. Um, The five loaves and the two fish came from a little boy's lunchbox. So you might feel, I've only got a lunchbox worth. Give what little you have in time, maybe, or in empathy, or perhaps in money. Commit that to God and watch him make something great out of it. Uh, I sometimes feel like that, that when I'm preparing for Sunday, to be honest. <laughs> it's difficult working a job and trying to um, be a co-pastor. But sometimes I pray, Lord, I've only got five loaves and two fish worth of time, but please will you do something with it? And I've found actually when I'm acknowledging that I've only got a lunchbox, God makes something like a feast out of it. Um, Proverbs 11.24 says this, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give, and he only suffers once. Don't be afraid to outgive God. If God has increased you with what you have, it's so that you've got more to give. And um, as well, just at the end of, um, of, this, of this section, Luke 9, as we draw to a close, I want us to think about this, that they ate and were satisfied. Eat of Jesus, feed on him. Let him be the one who is your strength. You will be satisfied. The more you eat of him, the more you'll be filled. You'll be satisfied. But I love that it says at the end, And what was left over was picked up. Twelve baskets of broken pieces. Why do you think there was twelve baskets? I wonder if it's because then the twelve disciples who'd worked really hard feeding five thousand people had something for themselves at the end of the day. And you know, as we serve God, he doesn't want to run you into the ground, but he wants to resource you in order that you can serve. So, as we just... um, draw to a close, remember Galatians 2.10 that um, Paula in uh, the cap talk said um, all that they that's uh, Peter and James in Jerusalem said to Paul, all that they asked was that we continue to remember the pillar. How are you going to do that? Maybe you'd like to be involved in the work of cap. Um, Maybe that work of mercy is something that God is calling you to be involved in. I'd love to see that. It'd be great if we can help people in that way from this, this area. Um, we've got some details on the back of your song sheet, so please do take them with you. Um, you can look on CAP's website. Also, if you are feeling like you're in that place where you could do it a little bit of support yourself, don't be embarrassed about that. Um, the ministry exists to help people, so take advantage of that. Um, maybe you'd like to help running the CAP money course, and uh, that'd be great be fantastic. Um, Please do speak to one of us as to how we could get that started. But may God give us that right attitude where we feel dry. May our service be spiritual. May we tell the truth in love, spiritual and practical, be in the hands and feet of Jesus. And may we take what we receive from him and be able to give that to others. We're going to have a song now that Isaac will play for us. And um, in the chorus, it says this, um, which I think really ties in with what we thought about this morning. Lead me in your love to those around me. So I trust you enjoy this and use it as your worship to God. We'll take some time now for those that would like um, to pray. Um, Pray quietly on your own, or if you'd like to pray, 
um, for others to hear. Uh, do step up to the microphone and that way you don't have to, um, to shout. <laughs> 